We have come to the pinnacle of the book of 2 Timothy, Paul's final letter before he awaits his execution. And he is going to give us one final major charge. Charge to Timothy to remain faithful, to persevere through the coming trials. And we should hear this in our very souls ourselves. Friends, this is uh, one of my favorite passages in all of the Bible. A man who is finishing his race strong. And we are challenged to follow in his steads, stead and, uh, and to run our race with endurance until the very end. I'm excited to go through his passage, and uh, you should be as well, because this is fantastic, uh, amazing stuff to be inspired by a man who lived his life and lived it until the very end, all for Jesus, with his whole life, his breath, and his whole heart. Let's open with a word of prayer, and then let's dive right in and start uh, to collect these gems that he scatters about. Lord God, I pray that you would open our hearts to be ready to hear what you have to say to us today. Lord, I pray that each person who joins us today, the study in your word will have an experience with you, that they would hear your voice speaking directly to them. Lord, help us each to be truly changed from this encounter with you. Lord, help us to walk this life, this day, as servants of you, followers of Jesus, in the ways that you have called us to and doing the things you have called us to. Lord, that you would give us that purpose and all the tools and all the things that we need in order to fulfill your calling upon our lives. Lord, we pray all these things in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. So remember, Paul is in a jail cell. He is awaiting execution. And here in chapter 4, as he winds up his final letter that we have to his good friend, his son in the faith, his disciple, Timothy. He says, I solemnly charge you before God and Christ Jesus. What is it that motivates you? Do you want to be pleasing to God and Jesus? Jesus is God, but we're implying here the Father and the Son. If we're motivated by that, then this is a meaningful charge, isn't it? While he is writing this directly to Timothy, we can take this charge to us as well. And we should. So I want you to prayerfully consider this as being written directly to you. I solemnly charge you before God and Christ Jesus, who is going to judge the living and the dead, and because of his appearing and his kingdom. This is all the prerequisite. This is all the, the, the why. Why this is so important. We're about to get into the what. What are we to do? What are we supposed to do? What, what should we do in response to this? But the fact that, that God has called us and he will judge us. He will, we will give an account and he will judge the world for the sins that they have committed. Now, if we are in Christ, we will be exempt from that judgment, but we will still give an account. He will come again. His appearing. He's coming soon. And his kingdom. He has all authority in heaven and on earth. Do we believe that? If so, then how do we respond? We find that in verse 2 here. Preach the word. Now, if you're like, I, I don't preach. I'm not a preacher. Remember, preaching is teaching or providing information and calling for a response. That's all preaching is, that you are calling for a response. I'm giving you this information. Now you need to do something with it. Uh, you could you could say it's kind of almost like a sales presentation, right? You're providing information, and then you're like, do you want to buy? 
does this, you know, does this solve your problem that you're looking at? Preach the word. We are to share the word of God and we are to call people to respond to it. As I am to you today, so you should with your children, your friends, your family members, your co workers, the strangers you meet along the way, to share the word with them. Do you mind if I share with you what, what God says about this? Or do you mind if I share with you a Bible passage that I think is, you know, speaks to what we're discussing here at this business? Preach the word. Well, that sounds like a high calling to be to be ready whenever, but that's that's the calling here. Be ready in season and out of season. Okay, when you're in a church building, yes, be ready. When you're outside the church building, also be ready, right? And how shall we do this? We should do this by correcting, by rebuking. Again, rebuking is somebody is in error. You tell them that they're in error. Correct them by saying you're in error, but but this is the way back. This is how you get to where you need to be, where you should be. If they're willing to hear the rebuke, if they're like, yeah, I know I'm wrong, but I don't know what to do, well, then you can help correct them. And to encourage with great patience and teaching, right? Once again, not only are, are we to correct, rebuke, and encourage, but we are to do so with great patience and teaching. Not only what we are to do, but how we are to do it. We should be known as people with great patience. If you see an impatient person, you will find a person who is immature in the faith. That's the truth. A person of short temper or a person who cannot stick with things, who cannot be faithful to the commitments that they've made or to the responsibilities that they've taken on, they're not a mature believer. Now, things can come up in our lives that make it so that we must choose one priority over another. A season where uh, a very active family in the church is serving and then suddenly um, they have a baby. I mean, I think we all expect that they become less um, consistent, that they become less um, um, less involved with certain uh, volunteer positions and stuff like that because they need to focus. That doesn't mean they're being unfaithful. It means they're being faithful in another area of their life. But we must be patient, enduring, unchanging. Now, when we need to change, we need to change, right? When when there, there's uh, uh, something wrong in our life, we need to be corrected and we need to be brought back on path. But, but where we are following Christ, we should not be wishy-washy. Verse 3, for the time will come, we've been discussing this in the last few days, right? For the time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, we'll multiply teachers or they'll gather teachers, right? For themselves, because they have an itch to hear what they want to hear. When people are not willing to hear the word of God, but they rather want to hear some pet doctrines or they want to hear pet um, topics, this is a warning to us. They will they will listen to whoever will scratch that itch. They don't want to hear about judgment. They don't want to hear about um, how we have an accountability to God and how God expects us to follow in Jesus' way. They don't want to hear that. They want to hear, well, God just loves you and thinks you're the greatest. Well. God does love us, but that doesn't mean that we don't have responsibilities. That doesn't mean that we're not being called to be more like Jesus. We must hear the entire counsel of God's word, not just the parts that we like. Do we just want to have our ears 
scratched? Do we just want to get that comforting um, feeling, that little buzz that we can get, knowing how important we are? And the truth is, we're not all that important at all. The only reason we're important is because God chose us. And why did he choose us? Because we're the most important, we're the best? Or No. Because God loved us. That's why. But but what about, I mean, I worked really hard. No, he loved, he chose us. He loved us. Not because we were greater or more prosperous or, or, or smarter than other people, but rather because he chose us. And if you want to go beyond that, you need to go ask God himself. Because if you've been to a church recently, you look around the room and you see a bunch of people that maybe you wouldn't have chosen. But God chose them. And that's that's his infinite wisdom. We can't see past our own faces, can we? We can't see what the word of what what God is accomplishing and what he is doing. So certainly we should not take his word of God, the word of God and cut it up and only keep the pieces we like. Ignoring all the pieces we don't like. And yet there are many people who do that today, whether because what they're about to say is unpopular or because they don't even like what they're about to say. So they stop and they don't say it. They skip those sections. That's one of the things I think is important for us to be working through the Bible verse by verse is because then we can't skip over parts that we don't like. We have to address all the passages. Have we covered some passages that have made me uncomfortable? Um, not only in this study, but in previous studies? Absolutely. There's some passages that's like, let's just skip that one. <laughs> um, that's going to be a difficult conversation. And yet we cannot do that. For all of scripture is inspired by God. It is God breathed as we saw yesterday. God is speaking to us. How dare we edit? what he has to say. Let us listen to it all. Let us read it all. Let us absorb it all. And where we are uncomfortable, we will realize those are the areas where we need to grow up in. Let us not conform God to our own image. That's called idolatry. But let us conform ourselves to his image. Verse 4. They will turn away from hearing the truth and will turn aside to myths. Just continuing on with that. They, that people will turn away from truth because it's uncomfortable. And sometimes they'll fill their minds with, with stuff that doesn't really matter. Trivial stuff. Or they'll focus on the passages that they want to hear. And other times they will make stuff up whole cloth. Myths. They will teach things as coming from Scripture that are not in Scripture, that God never said. They will twist what God has said to take him out of context and spin a myth about what God has said. But we need to hear what God says and just listen to him, not what somebody says about what God has to say. That's why it's important to have the Scripture right up here on the screen and for you to have your Bible open in front of you. When you go to church, have your Bible open in front of you, and uh, whether it's on your phone or, you know, hey, I do that. <laughs> I like having the passage of Scripture on my phone in front of me. Um, it's convenient, and that's all right. But you should be reading it for yourself. Is that what it really says? Be a Berean, right? Like the church in Berea. They, uh, they heard Paul, and they're like, okay, well, uh, that's an interesting thing you have to say. We're going to go back here, and we're going to go check it against Scripture. And Paul's like, finally, someone is actually going to like go look it out for themselves. And they, they studied the Scriptures, and they're like, you know, what you're saying is actually true. We find it here. It's here in Scripture. You're not off base. And they affirmed what Paul had to say. And we should do that, too. We should test, make sure that what is being taught is the Word of God. God has put the Holy Spirit within each and every one of us so that He can speak to us. That's the whole idea behind democracy. 
the idea of having a church voting together. It's because the Holy Spirit that lives in uh, every church member is the same spirit that lives and then dwells within the pastor. There is no special uh, revelation that comes to pastors that don't come to everyone else. Now, the pastor will hopefully spend more time studying the scriptures so that he can teach better and uh, share some of the gems and truths that he finds with the congregation. That's important. That's good. That's a wonderful, beautiful relationship. But it doesn't make him better. It doesn't mean that he is now has an exclusive uh, um, monopoly on, on God. No, we are all called to listen to the voice of God. But as for you, verse 5, exercise self-control in everything. Don't teach what you want to teach. Teach what you should teach. Self-control. This is about teaching the whole counsel of the Word of God and to serve others. Self-control. Not doing what's easiest and funnest and bestest for us. Endure hardship. Do the work of, the event of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Don't become so insulated as a leader in the church that you don't brush shoulders with unbelievers. And, and that can happen sometimes in church work where all the people you talk with are believers and you just don't even have any exposure to uh, unbelievers. We should seek out opportunity to make sure that we're still enough in the world that we can be a light. So we should be evangelists. We should share the gospel with unbelievers. We should fulfill our ministry, even when it is hard, even when it takes self-control. This is the calling he has put upon all of our lives, not just to pastors, but to each and every one of us. And why is it so urgent that he shares these things with Timothy? Verse 6. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time for my departure is close. He's not physically going somewhere, friends. He knows that he will be led out into the courtyard and beheaded. He knows that his life is at an end. And this is where we see in 2 Timothy that not only was this Paul's last letter, but he knew it. Verse 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. There is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not only to me, but to all those who have loved his appearing. Do you long for his appearing? Not just because it will deliver you from hardship, but because you love him. Do we love and long to see Jesus? If so, there is a righteous reward, a crown of righteousness that waits for us, that Jesus will give us as well as to Paul. It's interesting. It doesn't say those who do all the good works, but rather it says the crown is for those who Love is appearing. Is your life built around awaiting Jesus' return? Is your life built around longing for the day where Jesus will return? Are you doing the things that are pleasing to him until he returns? Are we motivated by love or are we motivated by guilt? Our love for Jesus should cause us to serve others. And because it's our love for Jesus, we can serve even the most unlovable people. We should be fair, even-handed, patient, and loving to even the most unlikable, unlovable people because Jesus is worthy. This is the fight, the good fight. This is our race. This is our faith. 
to walk with Jesus all the days of our lives, to do what is pleasing to him, and to boldly seek to obey him, to do the work of an evangelist, to fulfill our ministry, to make disciples of all nations, to endure hardship as they come, to to exercise self-control. Friends, this has been a journey through the book of 2 Timothy. We have a little bit more that we will pick up tomorrow, some closing thoughts that Paul has. But this is the pinnacle. And the question is, what will you do with it? So, friend, what will you do with this? Will you rise to the challenge? Will you chase after and long after Jesus? This would be worth taking some time to pray after this this episode. To contemplate between you and God, where are you? Are there things that you need to give up? Are there directions in your life that you need to change? Are you living for his purpose or are you chasing after your own purposes? Let me pray a prayer of blessing over you, but then I challenge you to spend that time with the Lord. Lord, as we hear this testimony from Paul, as he knows his life is about at an end, his last words to Timothy and to the rest of us are a charge for us to fight the good fight, to finish our race. Lord, help us to make our remaining days upon this world meaningful. Meaningful for your kingdom, in service to others, because of our love for you. Lord, I pray that you would work in the hearts of each person listening to this video today. That they would hear your voice, that they would hear your challenge that they would examine their own lives, that I would examine my own life to see what needs to change so that we may run this race with endurance for the rest of our lives. Lord, give us a vision of you that will endure all of our days. Lord, we pray all these things in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. All right, friends, we will join with uh, with each other again tomorrow, um, but we are wrapping up this book of the Bible. It's been an awesome journey. If you have learned some things, if you want to share with others what, what God's been speaking to you, pop those down in the comments down below. And then when we join together again tomorrow, we'll talk about those things as well. Until then. God bless you all. I'll see you later.